Hey everybody, this is Hercules Penix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at White Indian by Frank Frazetta. Um, this is a reprint from 1981. Nowadays you can get a beautiful hardcover apparently from uh, Vanguard Publications. I want to get that really bad because they do full color scans of the original Frazetta pages. This is way before they could do stuff like that. They uh, just didn't have the technology. So um, this is black and white reprints of uh, these stories, which were, uh, they were backups in Durango Kid. Durango Kid was a magazine enterprises, uh, golden age Western. And they had a backup comic called White Indian and Frank Frazetta drew it like a very young Frank Frazetta. Probably one of the longest series he ever drew I think, in fact, definitely it is, um, as far as comic books go. He did comic strips for, you know, longer. Um, well, maybe longer. But uh, this is his, kind of his magnum opus in comic books. We have a nice cover here. Uh, I noticed on the Grand Comic Database, some comic scholar debates that this is even Frazetta. He thinks it may be Frank Bowl, but that's just one guy. It looks kind of like early Frazetta to me, so I don't know. I've never seen Frank Boll draw this, I don't know, savagely and Frazetta-like. I kind of like the colors on it. Um, I, it doesn't say who did it, um, who knows, but it's kind of like watercolors and it's pretty nice. So unfortunately, this is just five or six random stories. They're not even in order. So, but it's really nice, especially back then. You know, you'd read about this stuff. You couldn't see it. I don't know when I picked this up. Um, probably much later than 1981. I would have freaked out if I could have found this back then. I was full on into Frank Frazetta as a kid. I had all of those, uh, I believe, Ballantine trade paperbacks. Uh, the Fantastic Art of Frazetta. I would just look at those like every other day. I'd take them off the shelf and just drool over Frank Frazetta's art. So let's get to White Indian, shall we? Um, so White Indian, apparently, for decades, everyone thought it was Gardner Fox. But Frazetta himself says, no, it was this guy who worked at Magazine Enterprises, Ray Crank. And um, I don't know whose word to trust. Uh, I think Frazetta would know. He'd, he'd have no reason to make that up. So apparently, these are written by Ray Crank. So we have the little splash panel here. So this is a very young Frazetta, but he's already really fucking good, especially considering who was drawing around 1949 in Golden Age comics, the quality of their art. Frazetta is like, I, don't know, I think he's like a teenager still drawing this stuff. And he's better than all of his you know peers or his elders. So we're introduced to this guy. And uh, what's this guy's name? Dan Brand. And he's just this lucky guy. He's good looking. He's wealthy. He's marrying this beautiful woman named Lucy Wharton. It's his childhood sweetheart. Or I'm sorry, just his sweetheart. And everyone at the wedding is like, oh, what a great couple. But this guy comes out of the balcony, Peter Bradford. And he's like, if I can't have her, no one will. I'm going to kill you, Dan Brand. And he shoots at Dan. But uh, his fiance runs in front of the bullet and she gets, she's killed. Lucy dies. So he's like, I want Bradford, bring him to me. But he like took off in all the excitement. So he buries his uh, fiance and he asks around and it turns out that Bradford went out west. I should mention this takes place in like the 1750s, 1760s, at least the first few stories. And, uh, you know, this is back when the West was east of the Mississippi River. I mean, that's pretty much the, the wild frontier. So Dan Brandis goes out into the wilderness with a horse and a gun. He doesn't really know much about frontiersmanship. Uh, this bear attacks him. He somehow survives a bear attack. Um, but he's like mortally wounded. So he wakes up later and he's with this Indian tribe. 
they kind of took him in and healed his wound. And, uh, and this guy's the chief of the Catawbas. I think his name's uh, Great Deer. And his son, Tipi. <laughs> so he tells them the deal. He says, I'm on a mission of vengeance. I got to go. And they're like, you can't. You're still too wounded. And he also basically, you know, drops some wisdom on him. He says, you're, in the, you're not going to be able to get revenge. You don't even know how to live in the forest. You know, you don't know the Indian lore, the ways of the forest. So why don't you stay here for a few months? We'll teach you. And then you can get your revenge properly and more effectively. So he's like, yeah, that makes sense. I'll do that. In this, these early comics, Frazetta draws really huge eyes sometimes. They're almost like manga. They're just really big. You know, he's learning. He's figuring stuff out. But just the musculature here and just the quality of illustrations. Frizzette is already on his way. So Dan Brand hangs out with the tribe. Uh, learns how to do everything. Wrestle, hunt, track people through the forest. All the Indian lore. But then one day there's a... One of the Indians stumbles in a camp. And uh, he, he dies in the chief's arms. But before he dies, he says, the Chippewas are attacking. So the Chippewas live across the mountain. An unknown white man has been selling them fire water and stirring them up to war so he can sell them more rifles and powder. So they're fighting the Chippewas and they're kind of kicking their ass. Here we see the Chippewas with their little mohawks. And we see the white man who's been egging them on. And it's Peter Bradford. The guy that Dan Brand, the white Indian, has to uh, get revenge on. And he's saying, fall back, Chippewa. <clears throat> and he shoots a few, uh, his gun. And one of the bullets finds Great Deer, the chief. And he dies. His last words are, avenge me, my son. Take care of TP. So uh, Dan Brand goes off. He's going to get Peter Bradford. He tracks him expertly because he knows all the Indian lore. And he finds him on this cliff. And he attacks him. And it looks like he's done for. Peter Bradford kicks him almost off the cliff. And he's hanging on for dear life, our hero. But then an arrow comes out of nowhere. It's Teepee. Teepee followed him. And he knocks the gun out of his hand. Gives Dan the chance to get up and slug Bradford and then he knocks him off the cliff to his death and this begins kind of like this there's kind of like a vaguely homoerotic thing going on between these uh two kind of Nambla-ish and uh they're both avenged because Bradford's dead and he's and T.P. says I'll never leave your side Dan I'll keep following you wherever you go I have no one else in the world to love now we are blood brothers. I have no one either, TB, no one to love. I think I found my home and my future here in the wilds. And I with you, of course, brother. So uh, kind of interesting, their relationship. TB is definitely bonded with Dan very quickly. So now we have the second story, the War of the River. And apparently they hear drum signals and they're, um, like kind of war drums and they're like uh oh I don't like the sound of this so at, at an Indian camp we see Chief Warning Thunder and Warning Thunder is basically saying like you know the, the gods want us to kill these white settlers a great tribe of white settlers are coming over the mountain and we, sh we have to slaughter them kind of the second in command of this tribe the assistant chief he's not liking it because uh, everyone else is riled up. They're like, yeah, kill him, kill them all. And he says, no, you're wrong. I am Eye of Hawk, second in rank only to Warning Thunder. This will only lead to more wars that will wipe out all of us. We must find ways of living in peace with the white man. And Dan Brand shows up and he says, yeah, Eye of Hawk is right. There's no stopping these settlers. And uh, we have to make peace or we'll all, you guys... We'll just face death and destruction. So the chief isn't having it. 
He says, seize the invader, seize Dan, <clears throat> kill him. But uh, Dan's not going to have that. So he escapes and uh, almost gets hit by this guy, but TP saves him. So he runs over to the settlers to warn them and uh, get them prepared. The guy's not scared, the white settler. He's just, and he's like, Dan Brand tells him, guys, there's thousands of them. They have guns too. We got to do something like crafty. We can't just fight them mano a mano. So he builds these giant rafts that are almost like forts, floating forts. There's walls, there's little holes so they can shoot their guns at the Indians in case they're attacked. And the Indians do, they come out in their longboats. And uh, the settlers fight him, fight him off. Chief Warning Thunder says, retreat, retreat. Look at this. You can see Frazetta. I love reading these comics, like just seeing the incipient Frazetta breaking through his eggshell, ready to be born <laughs> like a rough beast shambling towards Bethlehem. So now we're back at the tribe. And I have Hawk basically, uh, I guess, pull some protocol. He says, yeah, any chief who is defeated in battle loses his chiefdom. So I'm chief now. And I'm saying we got to stop attacking the white men. But uh, Warning Thunder is just like, fuck you. You're a traitor. I'm going to kill you. But then Dan Brand pops out of the bushes. And... Uh, He's fighting Morning Thunder. They both fall off this cliff into this, like, whirlpool. I don't know why there's a whirlpool there. And the chief doesn't come up, but Dan Brand does. So Tipe's very happy. And basically, uh, as he leaves, Eye of Hawk and him make a kind of a blood brother vow. And uh, he says, as long as I'm chief, there will be peace and friendship. You'll always be a friend, Dan Brand. Okay, we're seeing Frazetta become more and more Frazetti. And this is the third story. Uh, Brothers of the Wilderness. Already, already drawing this great foliage, which he uh, was one of his signifying uh, characteristics as a painter. He always drawing, like, taking time to draw this interesting stumps and uh, flora. <clears throat> So in this uh, story, Dan Brand and Teepee are helping these white settlers. Um, they're basically like their scouts, their guides, leading them through this treacherous land. And Dan hears a scream, and there's this woman in the, the settlers' camp, and this mountain lion, I think, is threatening her. And they're like, don't shoot, you might harm, harm her. So Dan Brand just goes in there with his knife and attacks this. And he kind of looks like an otter there. <laughs> I think he's a mountain lion. And he, he vanquishes the beast, stabs him with his knife. I kind of like this way this uh, mountain lion, it kind of looks almost cartoony. It's kind of weird, but definitely like threatening. And, you know, um, for Zeta, it might not be photorealistic, but it's expressive. Just uh, very animated the way this cat looks and moves. So uh, he rescues the girl. She's fine. The mountain lion's dead. Her father basically kind of implies like, you know, my daughter kind of has a thing for you. Why don't you settle down? Stop hanging around the woods all the time and uh, settle down and have a wife. And he says, I must admit, Mr. Cartwright, it's been, it's been kind of nice being with my own people these last few weeks. And Tipe hears that and just kind of walks off sullenly. And he's like, he misses his own people. He's tired of me and our life together in the wilds. I'm in his way. Fine, I'll just go back to my people. And then he says, oh, damn. <laughs> so there's definitely this like thing where they're like almost like partners, life partners. Look at the tree there, all gnarled and twisted. But... This is the thing. TP didn't hear what uh, what he continued to say. Dan continued to say, 
but my life in the wilds with Tip Teepee is dearer to me than anything else. You see, we have a mission together. And Teepee is closer than a brother. So Teepee's missing because Teepee took off. The next morning, uh, Dan is just like, where'd Teepee go? I gotta find him. As soon as Dan is out of earshot, these brigands attack the settlers. They're gonna rob them. But the leader of the brigands, he uh, takes a liking to young Lady Cartwright. And the father tries to defend his daughter and he just slaps him. He's a, kind of a weak old man. So he abducts the daughter and the father for good measure. When Dan Bryn gets back from looking for Teepee, they're like, they tell, the settlers tell him what happened. So uh, Dan Brand goes to, to rescue them. He's got uh, the leader of the brigands has got him tied up. And he's about to like flay the father for basically resisting. He, the father kicks him while he's tied up. He's going to flay him to an inch of, inch of his life. And the daughter's like, you'll kill him. But as he raises the whip, an arrow comes out of nowhere and knocks it out of his hand. Dan Brand attacks. Just look at this amazing fight scenes that Frazetta does. Like, just really well choreographed. So Dan beats the guy up and he frees uh, the Cartwrights. And um, they, they say, you know, basically surrender. And... Uh, Dan doesn't want to put their lives in danger, the Cartwrights, because they're going to shoot him. So he's, he says he surrenders. And then the guy's going to kill him. And then another arrow comes out of nowhere and knocks another weapon out of the brigand leader's hand. And it's Teepee and his tribe. They came to rescue them, which is a good thing, because uh, Dan Brand was in a bad situation. And uh, Teepee's kind of acting butthurt. He's like, I had a feeling you were in trouble. That's why I came back. But I must go away again now. I don't wish to stand in the way of my brother's happiness now that he wants to be with his own people once more. Farewell, Dan. And uh, the Lady Cartwright, she says, No, Tippy, you're wrong. Nothing we could do will take Dan away from his life with you. He told us that. And he says, I did. I did say that, Tippy. I meant it. He's like, what are we waiting for? Let's get back to the front frontier. Let's get back to our job helping these pioneers. There's work for us. And he looks happy as a clam. So this is just really deepening this uh, thing where this beautiful woman is in love with Dan. But Dan's like, oh, I'd rather run around the forest with my teenage, whatever, more than a brother, whatever he is. Here we got the trees of doom. And uh, where are we here? Oh, yeah, so Dan's hanging out with these uh, white settlers. That's the weird thing about this comic, I gotta say. It's like, yeah, sure, it sounds great. Like, you know, let's be peaceful. You know, tell the Indians not to massacre these settlers. But if you look at history, what the settlers did... They just kept encroaching on Indian lands and, and they massacred all the Indians and put them on reservations where most of them died. So it's just kind of weird that it's seen as heroic what Dan's doing. But it's like, no, Dan, you're doing horrible stuff by helping these guys. Because we all know that eventually these white settlers are going to run all the Indians off their land and kill them. So it's like, if Dan really was like in tune with his Indian side, not that he's half Indian, but, you know, he was... Great, uh, knowledgeable of their ways and, and he seems to appreciate their ways he would be like yeah guys we have to kill every white settler we see <laughs> they're no good they're gonna eventually ruin our whole way of life and uh, commit genocide against us but no that's not the case sorry to put my own little beliefs in there but that's how if you look at history you can't help but think that about Dan Brand it's like dude you're on the wrong side so um, they're gonna they're gonna float these logs down to Fort Pitt, and they're gonna build a city. They're gonna start building a city. 
And uh, then we cut away to this evil looking guy. His name is Mick Shane. And he's telling this tribe of Indians, he says, it's because I love the red man and his ways that I warn you of this great danger. The white men who cut down the trees will soon leave you without forest to hunt in. They will drive you off the land of your fathers. So you got to destroy them. And the Indians are like, yeah, he's right. So this guy who's the villain, he's actually right. <laughs> I mean, if you, you know, don't want all the Native Americans to be murdered eventually... He's totally telling it like it is. It's like the, the Indians should have done that. So basically this guy's totally, a, you know, he has his own lumber company. He just wants these Indians to do his dirty work and kill this lumber company that's, you know, going to build the city. One of the native, uh, one of the Indians, though, he's just like, this guy's face is too cunning. I don't trust him. Dan Brand would never, you know, he's the protector of Indians and white men a lot alike. I'll never betray him. So he runs to warn Dan. Dan's like, thank you. And uh, they make a plan. Because the, the Indians are like, outnumber these guys like 20 to 1. So Dan has this thing where he's like, okay, all these trees, like chop them. So they're just about to fall. So all they need is a push. So when these uh, this tribe attacks, uh, the set, the... The white guys basically push all the trees down, use the trees as weapons. So it takes out a lot of them, but they keep, you know, there's a lot of Indians. So they jump over the trees. A lot of them are crushed. And they have another wave of trees. They keep doing it. So basically all the, the Native Americans run off to defeat him. So then what's his face? Uh, the asshole guy. Um... He uh, has another plan. He's like, I'm going to make a log jam so all their logs won't make it down the river. So uh, Dan and his white friend, they they are like, oh, there's a log jam. Everything's going to, it's going to be like all choked up. So Dan and T.P. Uh, get some gunpowder and blow up this jam. And T.P. almost dies. He almost drowns. But uh, luckily Dan saves him. As you can see, I hope you're noticing this art. This is just so great to me. I mean, it's really rough for Zeta, but just so fun. I wish he did comics longer. He did so few comics, really, when you look at his, uh, what his amount of work he did in all fields. So he confronts this guy. And the Indians kind of come around and they're like, all of them, the whole tribe is like, yeah, you know, we won't stop you from kicking this guy's ass. This guy's led us to shame and his fire water has made us forget that you're our best friend. So I like this panel of him punching him in the mouth. That's a really nice art. It looks like something from like a European graphic album at the time. Like he was drawn so much better than most of his... Uh, peers in the comics industry and this is so silly so they build they they build the fort i'm sorry they build they start building the beginnings of a city outside this fort and uh dan brand is telling tp someday a great city will stand here maybe they'll call it pittsburgh <laughs> it's like so stupid he just somehow knows that they're going to call it that so this next one is called Tory Treachery. So now it's like kind of jumping ahead. We're full on in the Revolutionary War. Dan Brand is palling around with George Washington. And George Washington is telling uh, Dan that like, oh man, we're not going to make it. We don't have enough food or supplies. We're out of money. We need funds. So Dan says, maybe I can help. So Dan puts on some like leather britches, like he's a, a white settler. And uh, steal some horses. Him and T.P. steal some horses from these uh, redcoats. And he makes it back to his old home. So I guess ever since he left Philadelphia, you know, for his on his mission of revenge, you know, his butler's still at his mansion. Everything's the same. He's got all his money in the bank. He's still a rich guy. He just lives out in the frontier. So he says, oh, all my, all my old 
rich friends and all the richest guys in the city. I want you to call them here for a little soiree. So all the guys, are, they're these total rich turds. And this is kind of telling how uh, Dan makes Teepee serve drinks like he's a little butler. <laughs> I mean, he's supposed to be his like best friend. And he's like, Teepee, you're serving drinks. And, you know, just to show the caliber of these rich guys, Teepee spills a drink on this guy and he like slaps him with his glove. Like he's just a turd. He's just an asshole guy. You know, of course, he's also a Tory, an English sympathizer. And he's just like, when he finds out what Dan wants him there for, he's like, all the rich guys are like, hell no. We're not going to give money to that mob of mechanics and peasants. They're nothing but rabble. We would never revolt against our majesty, the king. But there's this one guy named Haim, Haim Solomon. And he says, I'll give you all I have. Um, I'm an old man. I can't join you in your fight. But hopefully my money will, uh, that's how I will wage war. So this asshole guy, uh, Darcy, he's the guy who slapped Teepee in the face with the glove. He overhears this and he, while Teepee and Dan are walking over to Haim's house to get the money, he beat him to it. Uh, Darcy and some friends, uh, some of his flunkies, put on masks and robbed him. Were about to kill him, but luckily Dan and Teepee scared him off before they could kill him. Uh, so one of the guys left a glove behind, and Teepee says, I know that glove. That's the same glove he used to slap me. I, can't, I couldn't uh, not recognize it. So they realize Darcy's up to this. So now we cut away to Darcy and his friends gloating. And they're like, this is great. We got all this money and we helped out the King of England and uh, Washington's troops are going to be fucked. And then Dan just jumps through the window. I love how savagely he draws him here. I mean, God, it looks like he has claws. It's like very expressive. So he comes here. Uh, I'm sorry, he comes in the room and then they have a sword fight, him and Darcy. And he stabs Darcy right in the gut. This is before the comics code where you could show someone running someone through with a like sword and blood coming out of their mouth. So they get the money and go and they give it to Washington. And he, Washington says, the name Haim Solomon shall live proudly through all history. And shame on me, I guess my history's not that good, but I don't know if that's supposed to be, like we are supposed to know who Haim Solomon is, if he's a famous character in history. I don't know. I probably should. Now we have Sleep of Death. Look at that front piece panel or whatever, splash panel. It's so good. We're really seeing Frazetta come into his own once again. Look at that. Just taking all this extra time to draw this beautiful flora. So we're in the Mohawk Wigwam of Chief Redfoot. And his, like, shaman is, a. Uh, He's uh, seen the future. He's telling him his pro you know, what he's seen. And uh, the shaman is Sagaba. He says that now is the time to descend upon the white settlers in the valley and cut them to pieces. Chief Redford says, fuck no, your medicine's wrong. I've sworn to Dan Brand, my blood brother, I, I will never wage war on the white settlers. A Mohawk does not go back on his word. As long as Dan Brand lives, there will be peace. Take your foolish medicine elsewhere. So he says, ah, as long as Dan Brand lives, eh? So he makes up this poison. And then we cut away. Dan is hanging out with one of the settlers in the valley. And they're drinking cider. And this little hand, kind of funny the way it's drawn, just kind of snakes in and is pouring the poison in one of the cups of cider. But what happens is Tipi picks up that glass. And after a few sips, he feels hot, terrible and falls over. And he almost seems dead. He seems dead, but he's not. And the white settler knows what's going on. He knows about the Mohawks. They've got this special, you know, poison potion, the sleep of death. It brings on a coma. And only a few Mohawk medicine men know how to counteract it. 
So he's got to find a cure. He's got to go find the Mohawks and uh, make them give him the cure. Yeah, man, his heart's getting good already. I think he's still a teenager at this point. He's still so young. So he takes him to the Mohawk camp. And um, Saginaw comes in there and acts like he's all concerned. He's like, our little brother T.P., how terrible. What evil renegade Mohawk could have done this? So he's like, oh, shit. Dan Brand didn't drink the poison. T.P. did. He's the one I wanted to kill. So he says, I know another medicine man who knows the cure. I'll lead you to him. Me and some some of my uh, our warriors will take you there. Really, they're just sit, leading him into a set of traps. Uh, while they're on the trail, two of these guys knock a, push a boulder down. Luckily, it misses Dan. And then they're like, some of these guys hiding in the woods are shooting arrows at Dan. And, you know, Saginaw's playing dumb, just like, oh, it must be our enemies. Quick, get in this cave. And, uh, Dan offers Saginaw some water. This has some really interesting inking here. Just like, he's really getting good for Zeta. And he gives him some water. And it's not water. It's some of that poison. And he's like, no, no, no. You. So he has to give him the cure. He has to tell him how to make the cure so he can save him. Save himself. So he says, the cure is made from a strong broth made from birch bark. Save me, please. So Dan goes flying out as fast as he can. Finds those Mohawks who've been trying to ambush him. And uh, he kicks their ass. Man, that's a great panel. He finds some birch bark. But he's like really wounded. Those guys uh, tagged him when he was uh, kicking their ass. And he makes the broth. And uh, he feeds it to TP. One of the Mohawks, though, wasn't tied up as well as Dan thought he was because Dan was so distracted by saving Teepee's life. So he crawl comes into the cave and uh, he's about to kill both of them. But then Teepee wakes up from his coma and uh, he gets the best of that Mohawk warrior. And he says, pick up Dan Brandon, and start carrying him to the camp, the Mohawk camp, pronto. So everything's made right. The chief realizes what a shitty medicine man he has and they kick him out of the tribe, him and his cohorts. And uh, the chief even says, we shouldn't have even given him that, that birch bark cure. We should have let him die. But Dan is such a straight arrow. He's just like, oh, you know, mercy's a good thing. We did the right thing. And here's the last story, the blood of Valley Forge. <laughs> and here, in the... The opening panel, they're skiing. I don't even know if that was a thing back then. Maybe it was, I don't know. So Valley Forge, you know, it's the time of Valley Forge. They're not doing very well. Once again, uh, Dan is trying to get funds. He's talking to all the people saying, "We, General Washington needs money. Come on guys, kick in. So there's this one Tory guy, Hutchins. And, uh, Hutchins realizes, ooh, if I could, like, uh, challenge Dan Brandt to a duel, like, start a fight, so we have to duel. Um, you know, he's been living with the Indians so long, he, he probably isn't very good at shooting guns, and I'm a great shot. So he trips Tippy. Man, this is so Frazetti. He's really coming into his own. This is really good stuff. It's the inking here. So he, he's basically slapping TP around. Dan Brand, of course, does not like that. And he attacks him. And so this guy challenges him to a duel. Yeah, you can tell for that he's kind of learning because it's almost like his inking changes. He's trying out different shit. This almost looks like, um, you know, Milt Caniff type stuff, doing that chiaroscuro type of, um, of shading or inking. So different than this panel, which is like very fine lines. So they have a duel the next day at dawn. And 
Dan, I guess his Dan's strategy is just to stare at the guy. <laughs> and it works. He's like, those eyes, they burn and they accuse me. Am I a traitor? And so he's so worried about this, he misses Dan. And then he was, I like this battle here. He's just sweating bullets. He looks like a character in a Jack T. Chick comic. And he's like, he's raising his gun pointing it. I think I'm going to faint. And Dan just shoots it into the air because he's such a good guy. And Hutchins passes out. Totally cowardly. And everyone's all like, that coward couldn't take it. That Dan's a good guy. He did the sporting thing. And Dan says, I don't believe in killing anyone in cold blood. That's a look how good he's getting here. So but this inspires all these guys to say, Dan is Dan's right. Let's chip in to General Washington. And he delivers the goods, all this food and stuff to General Washington. He's like, we're going to make it through the winter. Thanks to you, Dan. But then they, I'm sorry, they also still have to get it through enemy lines. So the British are all over, creeping all over these woods. So they've got to sneak past them. They can't, normally it would be easy to sneak past them, but they have this whole wagon train, you know, slowing them down, full of stuff. So uh, Dan breaks a barrel, the staves off, and makes skis. He's like, this is the only way we can get down that mountain fast enough to intercept those guys. So him and Teepee um, ski down. It's great panels. It almost looks like a later Barry Windsor Smith there. But of course, vice versa. And the British Patrol spot them. Dan kicks these guys' asses, takes their horses, and uh, leads them on a merry chase. They jump off their horses, so the horses keep running. So these guys will be following the horses' hook trail for quite a while so it allows them to sneak past and get all of the the goods to the troops and Washington thanks Dan in America's name I thank you and here we have a little bonus uh, Frazetta did some of these one pagers um, kind of like public service announcements and this is we can stop the enemies of youth and we see this guy becomes a, a drug addict and a drug dealer to support his habit. And, you know, he ends up just sick and desperate. And everyone, all these other guys are like, he's a dope fiend. We'd better keep away from him. And this is telling kids to report dope peddlers wherever you see them. Report them to clergymen. <laughs> Anyone. The dope peddlers. So there you go, White Indian, the 1981 reprint of a, a handful of White Indian stories. Like I said, you can now get every single White Indian story in color from Vanguard Press. Um, oh man, I gotta hunt that down. I really want that. After checking these out in black and white, even though it's really nice to see the art in black and white, but uh, I like color comics in color. If they're originally meant to be in color, that's how I want to see them. But this is some nice, pretty stuff, and it's really nice seeing Frazetta. Um, you know, before he was Frazetta with a capital F. I guess he already, always had a capital F, but, you know, we didn't know. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this, and uh, I'll see you next time here at the Hercules Pedics Academy of Comic Book Studies.